Ia Kukutadze, Andre Mariti, Stefan Aplus, and Mariam Urdia. Our speakers explore topics related to architectural and urban practices that are governed by modernity, local traditions, political ideology, and globalization of the South Caucasus. The South Caucasus has seen drastic change within the last 150 years, transitioning from predominantly agrarian practices to modern urban agglomerations. Most recently, the, the Soviet era's social and political ideologies imposed new forms of experimentation in architectural and urban topologies, effectively restructuring the social dynamics and identities of the region. With the collapse of the Soviet Union, Armenia, Georgia, and Azerbaijan forged their own independent interpretations of architectural and urban development, and in so doing and redefining their own identities, both globally and locally. So this broad overview will be explored by our speakers through some of their topics. Uh, the, the event is moderated by myself, an architect and researcher from South Africa. Uh, my, research my research interests lie in understanding how these independent countries are dealing with the idea of identity reconstruction in independent post-Soviet conditions. South Africa, my home country, uh, too, is undergoing the arduous task of developing its identities in a post-apartheid or kind of post-racial segregation and post-colonial condition. But today we focus on the South Caucasus and aim to discover some of its projects, some of the projects that are influencing and orienting its identity reconstruction at varying scales. So uh, I'm just gonna paste a link in the chat. Um, it's just a link to a, a document that uh, kind of collates all the information of today's presentation. Um, and over to you, Maria. Yeah, thanks, Doreen. I would like to introduce some basic house rules, even though I'm sure everyone knows how to use basic functions on Zoom. Please mute yourself, put your microphone off when you are not speaking. Don't be late during breaks in order to start on time. If you want to ask a question, either put in the chat box or there is a raise a hand button and so you can ask your question yourself. Also, please note that the event will be recorded and made available on our YouTube channel and used on various social media channels. Gwen, I'm passing the word to you. Okay, um, I'm going to take a brief moment to introduce our network, uh, the Caucasus Through Time Network, for those of you who are joining us for the first time. Um, so we are a group of master and PhD students all working on the Caucasus. And the aim is to bring together regional archaeological, anthropological uh, his and historical debates and discuss current research carried out in the Caucasus. Um, we are open to the fields of history, art history, anthropology, archaeology, architecture, medieval studies, literature, and historical linguistics, all related to the Caucasus and adjacent areas. And the network is an inclusive and encouraging environment, and we put strong emphasis on uniting, transcending national boundaries, and enhancing dialogue. Importantly, we provide a space for young scholars to showcase their work and thereby facilitate knowledge exchange among scholars and early career researchers. Uh, now back to Darren. Hi. Uh, thanks, Gwen. Uh, a quick introduction of today's program. Um, our first speaker, Andre Maruti, an architect uh, with a PhD from Politecnico di Milano, will be speaking about the urban transformation of Yerevan, the journey from a provincial village to a capital city. Uh, Ia Kupatadze, uh, Associate Professor at Ilya State University, will be speaking about the Soviet city as an ideological space. Our final two speakers, Stefan Aplis, Associate Professor at the University of Munster, discusses the vibrant spaces of Svaneti in Georgia. And lastly, we offer the platform to Mariam Urdia, a PhD student at Ilya State University, uh, who will be talking about the Nkavari River river as a space of human nature assemblage. Uh, each presentation will, will have a short Q&A session, so as the presentations are being are happening, uh, please post some questions in the chat or raise your hand and we'll address them after each presentation. Without further ado, we'll, we'll introduce our first speaker, um, Andre Maruti. Andre is a practicing architect at, in Los Angeles with a PhD in preservation of architectural heritage from Politecnico di Milano. In his PhD dis 
dissertation, he reconstructs the image of Yerevan and Gyumri during the 19th century through the lens of European travelers and highlights the preservation status of their major monuments. He has participated in numerous symposia and has given lectures in Europe and the US. So without further ado, uh, Andre. Uh, hello, everyone. So I'm going to share my screen. Okay, everyone, I'm going to talk about the Yerevan city, the capital of Armenia. The Yerevan's location is, is very favorable both for agriculture and animal husbandry. So that's why from the early prehistory ages, it was a continuous human settlement. The earliest settlement is in Shengavit in southwest of Yerevan, which is going back to early Bronze Ages. During the Urartu kingdom between nine to six century BC, the Urartian kings built two fortresses in the vicinity of modern Yerevan, the Erebuni fortress in south, and the Karmir Belur Fortress in Southwest. Uh, while in the sixth century BC, the Urartu kingdom declined, the Yerevan and Erebuni Fortress uh, lasted significant. And during the next centuries, uh, Armenia fell in, under the influence of Hellenistic uh, culture and Sassanid Persian empire culture. And uh, generally, Yerevan lost its uh, significance. The next phase which Yerevan gained some importance is going to be in the 15th century, uh, when the Ottoman Empire gained power and started capturing the lands which historically belonged to Persians. So uh, in 1582, the Turks built the first fort fortress in Yerevan. And in 1601, Persians, Safavid Persians, recaptured the Yerevan and fortress became a Persian one. In 1670, an earthquake destroyed the fortress. So the Yerevan governor, the Persian governor, built new facilities, a new fortress with a big palace and uh, a residence for women, a harem, and this is the palace, this is the harem, several mosques in the fortress, and a beautiful garden with a pavilion in the other side of the Harazdan River, which we can see in the map. And these are the demonstrations of European travelers, the illustrations which they provided. The fortress in, is in the, in the left side in this illustration and the garden and pavilion in the right side. This one is from Kerr Porter in 1821. We can still see the fortress and Persian pavilion. So during the Persian governance, Yerevan prospered both economically and culturally. And the Persians built many schools, bazaar, mosques, caravansarais, and the general image of the city became that of a Persian city. Uh, now I'm going to analyze two illustrations, one from Tavernier who traveled to Yerevan in 1668. This is the illustration he provided. We clearly see the fortress, the gardens, the garrison and the residential areas. Something important to note here is the gap between the fortress and the residential area, which the next traveler, Chardin, in a more detailed illustration, also shows that this is the fortress. There is the gap between fortress and the residential areas, the orchards, gardens, and the houses. So, while in the beginning of the 19th century, Russia captured the Caucasus, uh, again for the second time, Yerevan lost its importance. And Gyumri, being close to Tbilisi and Baku, 
became more significant. And the Tsar Nikolai I visited Gyumri and Russians built very modern fortification and garrison in uh, the north side of the city. And the name of the Gyumri changed to Alexandropol. So the Persian monuments in the Yerevan became to decay. And another earthquake in 1860 uh, destroyed the walls of the fortress and the palace. This is the map of Yerevan in 1856. We can still see the distinct locations, the residential area, the fortress, and the gap between the areas. This is the gap between the areas. So in 1856, Russians uh, impl implement the first master plan in Yerevan, but uh, it was constructed uh, partially, not completely. So we can see that they built straight streets, but the dense areas, residential existing areas did not cut. The, the concentration of new buildings is into those two circles. And they are individual buildings without any specific master plan and relation to each other. According to uh, provincial Russian style or Art Nouveau or whatever was fashion of the day. So in the next chapter is, uh, sorry, before going there, this is uh, Henry Finnis Lynch, the British traveler who visited Yerevan in 1898 with the camera and he provided the first photographs. And this is the photograph he provided from Yerevan. It's very much similar to the illust illustrations that the travelers uh, provided us in previous centuries. So the urban image is not changed very much. The next chapter is starting with the First World War and the Russian Revolution. During the First World War, Russian army captured the Turkish uh, Ottoman territories. But after the revolution, when uh, the Russian army went back to the uh, Russian territory, an armistice happened a vacuum of power uh, occurred and the Turks started to capture the, the cities, specifically Armenian cities rapidly. And in this period, the, the Alexandropol or Gyumri was occupied by Turks. Next chapter is the first Republic of Armenia. We all know that between 1918 and 20, Armenia, Azerbaijan and Georgia gained independence for a short period of time before Bolsheviks took over. And in this time, uh, Yerevan became the capital of the Republic because Gyumri uh, was under the Turks occupation. Uh, Yerevan hardly had a sufficient structure for, the, for even the government meetings. So it was in need of a master plan and expansion. This is the map of Yerevan in 1920. You can see that uh, it's a very small area. In 1920, Bolsheviks took over the Armenia and uh, Yerevan, again, the capital of the city needs to be modernized, expanded. So uh, they invited Alexander Tamanyan, a Russian born Armenian architect who was a studied architecture in uh, St. Petersburg's Academy of Art in 1904 to design the first master plan of Yerevan. Uh, Tamanyan was very much uh, familiar with the Garden City movement and he implemented and adapted the Garden City ideas into the Yerevan's master plan. This is the Yerevan master plan uh, proposed by Tamanyan. Uh, he provided a green, build, a green belt uh, with the core zone and clearly distinctly divided the area into industrial, university, uh, commercial, entertainment, and residential zones. Tamanyan's uh, 
contribution to Armenian architecture is not limited to the urban design. Uh, being an architect and art historian, he was very well familiar to Armenian traditional architecture and its elements and proportion and language. He successfully combined those traditional elements to uh, neoclassical architecture uh, and its elements and created a new style suitable for the modern functions which any modern city was in need. So uh, these are the very famous Tamanian buildings and the Armenian traditional architecture elements implemented in them. So the Original master plan by Tamanian was designed for 150,000 inhabitants, but soon the city uh, grew and the inhabitants reached way more than 150,000. This was due to the First World War genocide, immigrants from East Armenia, which all of them settled into Yerevan. And soon in 1935, he proposed an expansion to the North and in 1938, another master plan by, by Zargaryan and Malozyunov uh, proposed that we can see uh, the expansion goes to all different directions, not limited into the north, south, west, and all directions. So the, the city was in need of uh, low cost housing and uh, Many high-rise, low-quality buildings and the structures were built, and the image of the city was gradually starting to change. But uh, an important thing to say is that all these high-rises and large structures were built outside the green built and historic core that Tamanian has suggested. In this map, the darkest blue are the tallest buildings, and the pink ones are the Tamanian style buildings. We can see that the core is uh, respected. Not many buildings are changed and there, isn't, there was no plan for uh, building high rises in, in between the green built. This is the opera built by Tamanian and we can see that the green built is very well respected. So then the Republic of Armenia and independence of 1991 happened and uh, the city rapidly started to expand. The developers and capitalist ideas took over and many high rises everywhere in Yerevan uh, disrespect to the green built historic core started to be built. Many old monuments were, uh, belonging to Russian period were destroyed and tall structures right next to the older ones were erected. These are some examples of the new architectural styles which filled the historic core of Yerevan rapidly. In this photo, we can see that this is the historic core and many, many tall high rise buildings are there and the green built is not respected very well. Uh, my aim in this presentation was not to criticize any development. I just wanted to rapidly give you a, a narrative uh, of the, what happened from 16th century while it was a provincial village to the modern while it's a capital city, you can say a modern capital city. Thank you for listening to my presentation. So much, Andre. Um, very, in very interesting in, at how it developed and, and where it is today. Um, 
and the, the economic change and shift uh, and what that post or the independence has resulted in uh, in Yerevan today. I mean, what kind of stood out to me and, and what has stood out to me uh, is this, especially now in, in this independent state, it's the, the kind of the, not really contestation, I guess it's, it is the, the relationship between the, the local residents and the official, the elite narrative. Um, because the, the, the kind of the state narrative is, is talking about one thing where the locals maybe are not, uh, I guess, being respected or the, the kind of the, the historical references are not being respected. Um, but we also have to kind of deal with this idea of modernity. Um, and I mean, there's another interesting part in your thesis about the, I think it's Tamanian uh, respected the, the existing textures of the city and, and kind of allowed the city to grow uh, through that. Um, and, and to grow very, not sporadically, but uh, quite um, dynamically uh, in a way where, where there wasn't very much planning as such, but it was there to, to promote growth of the city. Um, and I think, I mean, I think that's a very interesting kind of relationship. It's like, where does the city draw the line in, in terms of how do you how do you allow for the, the local residents to develop their own um, spaces and narratives uh, versus being kind of very strictly planned and kind of segregating space and I, I mean that's it's just the interesting idea of like what the the narrative versus kind of the local um, discussion is really, yeah. Thank you, Darren. I think there is a question. So there is a question from Leila Saifutinova. I hope I pronounce your last name correctly. Uh, she says, thank you for your presentation. I have a question about your views of term Persian town. You may know that this issue has been very controversial recently between Azerbaijan and Armenia. Could you explain what exactly you mean by Persian town, a special type of a spatial organization belonging to Persian empire or ethnically, ethnically Persian population? Uh, yes, we can say that because the, during the Persian uh, governance of Yerevan, uh, it was not just the city of Yerevan, it was Erivan Khanat. You know, there were different Khanats, Erivan, Shirvan, Ganje, Baku, and all of them were uh, under the Persian dominions. The Persian governors were uh, ruling the areas. Uh, Yerevan was one of the most economically fruitful ones. And uh, the style of the buildings, the architecture was, was very much uh, according to Persian architecture. We cannot say Persian empire, Persian architecture elements, which are the uh, central courtyard, caravansarais, bazaars, mosques. Uh, actually, we can say that in uh, many periods between uh, 18th and 19th centuries, Armenians were not the majority of the population of Yerevan. Uh, Persians, Kurds, and other ethnic uh, nations were forming the majority of population. And Armenian uh, residential areas was limited to uh, maybe Gond, Chahartav, or uh, Demirbular. Not all the residential areas was belong to Armenians. They were ethnically separated. And in 19th century, there were more mosques in Yerevan than uh, churches. There were 79 mosques. Uh, and I know that this is a very controversial uh, issue, but uh, yes, that's the reality. 
Any, any further questions, comments? Andre? Something I can add regarding Tamanian and his style is that during that period, uh, not only Armenians, uh, but the Georgians, Azerbaijanis, Armenians, the South Caucasian nations were in need of finding an identity because the territories was first uh, captured by Russians, then Turks, then Bolsheviks took over. They tried to gain independence. And mm, in this case, especially Armenians after the genocide, they lost the territories, they lost the population. So Tamanian gave something more than just an architectural style, gave an identification to the nation to the nation which was in verge of uh, extinction, basically. Maybe that's the reason why Tamanian's style is uh, respected in Yerevan and not other periods, not no, any Persian uh, architecture is remained, no Russian architecture is very well respected, no modern uh, constructivist architecture is respected and all of them are, we are losing all of them day by day. Um, may I, Darren? Oh, uh, may I ask a question? I uh, raised my hand. So thank you, Andre. I was just uh, going to ask a question about Tamanyan as well. Uh, first of all, you mentioned that uh, he kind of combined the, the paradigms of traditional architecture and neoclassical style, which was kind of typical for his area in 1920. Um, um, what is, in, in your opinion, uh, do, do um, like concerning to, to the independence time, do you see similar tendencies to include uh, some motifs of traditional Armenian architecture, let's say Armenian medieval churches, motifs of them into the new constructions, uh, into the new plannings. And um, concerning to your, your, your assumption or your, uh, your sentence that uh, like the, the mod in modern time, the ideas of our Tamanyan are not being rest uh, respected, which is totally true. But don't you think that it's kind of the zeitgeist of post-socialist areas in general, and we cannot limit it to, uh, to Armenia? I mean, even here in Germany, I see tendencies like that. Uh, I totally agree with you uh, regarding the traditional elements implementing into new high-rise architectures. I can say that the architects are trying to do that, but Tamanian did it uh, in a much better way, maybe because he was more familiar with the architecture history, or maybe because the scale was closer to that of traditional architecture. But uh, that's not the reason. If the architects, the modern architects try harder, I think they can uh, create better combinations between traditional and modern, not modern is not a correct word, traditional and contemporary architecture. I think they are not trying their best. This is my personal opinion. And regarding your second comment, the zeitgeist of Soviet, uh, I'm seeing a subtle difference in uh, Armenian case. And uh, as I uh, mentioned previously, this is uh, maybe re it's regarding to genocide and the question of uh, extin extinction. Armenians were more in need of an identity and re revival during those times. And maybe Tamanian's uh, style, the intro introduction of Tamanian styles was, uh, it was in uh, the, the very correct moment. It was a uh, flirtatious, very specific time, which the society was ready to capture it. I think that's the subtle difference between 
the combination of traditional elements in Armenia and in other Caucasus regions. Thank you. Of modern arc or contemporary architecture, as you said, um, that is maybe a, a better example to see. Um, that would be a, a interesting, another interesting discussion, definitely. I don't Future think, discussion, yeah. Yeah, 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 absolutely. You have to organize that. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> the next, the next seminar, yeah. <laughs> um, all right. Uh, any, uh, should we, I think we should move on. I think we're a bit behind on time, um, unless there's any further comments. Uh, right. So, our next speaker, Ia Kupatadze, works as an associate professor at the School of Engineering and Architecture uh, program at Ilya State University. Her personal interest is sustainable architecture and urban development. Her dissertation dealt with issues such as what changes has sustainable architecture development brought in the construction field? Is architecture less aesthetically pleasing, but more environmentally friendly or vice versa or both? Are we going back to fundamentals to vernacular architecture? On this topic, she has been working together with her mentor at Cornell University in 2013 and 2014. Among other studies, Ia has, present, has been researching two cities in Georgia, Saltubo and Chiatura, which were developed during the Soviet regime. In both cases, brutal, brutal interventions were carried out in order to satisfy the Soviet administration, and most importantly, produce goods for the Soviet republics. Together with the Institute of Sustainable Urbanism at TU Braunschweig, she has worked on mass housing development in Georgia and Germany. What can be done to improve living conditions? What are the key challenges that dwellers encounter? Right now, she is leading a new project, Tbilisi, as a formal and informal space. The interdisciplinary research group will study the city during a certain period of time, analyze the master plans from different times and visualize their changes. So yeah, hand over to Ian. Thank you. Thank you. Can you can you hear me? Yes. Okay, great. Um, let me share the screen. Um uh, good evening. For me it's evening here. <laughs> Um, today I'll talk about the Soviet city, a city as an ideological space. Uh, mm, Tbilisi, the capital of Georgia, was harshly redeveloped uh, by Soviet authorities from the early 30s uh, through late 70s and afterwards also. Uh, and my research focuses on um, Mm, analysis of Soviet city planning strategies and ideal and their ideological basis. I try to explore mm, and draw parallel between uh, closed and open city system and ask the question: What was the specific city structure formation process during this time, and how did this process impact the openness of the city that has been formed gradually in centuries? In doing so, I identify major structural and conceptual changes uh, and uh, that resulted uh, the city structure uh, that even today remains difficult to adjust or change and improve. Uh, for the methodology, uh, I used uh, <clears throat> archival documents. So uh, I used master plans, which were done in 1934, uh, 50s and 70s, uh, analyzed these drawings and uh, also the explanatory notes and uh, explanatory material, which is uh, kept uh, some of them in archives and some of them are kept uh, in a personal archives of uh, family members. So I have uh, trying to uh, been trying to find them and uh, trying to interview if uh, they're 
Uh, so, yeah, if uh, they are still alive or if they're not, they're family members because they give us a lot of information, which is unfortunately not written in the, pa in the papers. Uh, so in my uh, uh, presentation, I, I will try to make it short. Uh, uh, so I'll try talk a little bit uh, introduction, then I talk about pre-Soviet Tbilisi to understand uh, how it was structured before Soviet redevelopment, then Soviet redevelopment, and I will try to um, underline main uh, components on open and open uh, uh, system, uh, open city system, and uh, Tbilisi. What, what, what were the significant points? Uh, uh, as a sociologist, Richard Sennett writes, uh, the city in which everyone wants to live must be clean and safe. Must be must possess efficient public service. Uh, supported by a dynamic economic, uh, uh, um, must provide cultural stimulation, also must heal society's separation on the basis of race, class, ethnicity. The city can be open and closed system, which in, an open system represents a bottom-up up approach where individuals have the ability to take part in the uh, process of formation of the city. In a closed system, cities are pre-planned uh, by authorities and technocrats in a top-down process. Formation of a city uh, regulated, uh, is a, a regulated so that everyone fits properly based on notion that effective planning will ensure cleanness, safety, and efficiency. Similar to open and close to the system, Christopher Alexander, an architect and theorist, refers to this type of cities as natural and artificial. So when he talks about natural city, meaning means that uh, through many years, uh, city has been developed uh, uh, through spontaneous action, formed, changed, inhabited by its dwellers. By contrast, an artificial city has been deliberately created by designers and uh, planners. And as uh, you see in a uh, quote from uh, Richard Sunet, uh, it very well describes the open city feels like Nepal and a uh, closed system looks like Frankfurt. Um, when Soviet uh, uh, planners decided uh, to uh, develop the city, uh, they started to think what should be the Soviet city, what it should be like. So uh, they uh, they try to um, I think uh, how this should be structured. Uh, and there were uh, uh, I want to talk about it, but there were like urbanist and the urbanist group uh, who uh, created their own ideas how the Soviet city should be. Uh, but uh, uh, Soviet authorities did not agree um, in, with the suggested city development strategies fully. Uh, what they did is that combine, uh, combine a variety of planning approaches with their own ideological approach to the city planning. Um, uh, and uh, um, as Eric Mumford uh, states, so it's called a linear city concept, which was proposed by Melutin, uh, was uh, taken as a base uh, for planning the new city in Soviet Union. Um, I uh, I also uh, have to mention that uh, from previous presenter, uh, Garden City was also one of the uh, uh, influence of Soviet uh, city planning as well. Um, Tbilisi um, uh, was a feudal city uh, where its first dwelling units were arranged along the river Tkwari, uh, and uh, it was expanded uh, and houses were built on the mountain ridges uh, uh, amalgamated into the natural landscape. From historic writings on the fourth century, Tbilisi was already a densely populated area um, with more or less city structure, but the fifth uh, century Tbilisi was established as uh, an economic trading shop and political center. Tbilisi initially was uh, a capital uh, for East and uh, connected uh, to East and West. Uh, 
Um, this, of course, influences its architecture and culture. Mm, uh, at the same time, we see bazaars, caravanserais, bath shops, equipment, and uh, oriental ornamentation, and facades with typical Islamic shape uh, dominating archi in architecture. Even the narrow winding streets uh, with stone pavement, a style that was imported from Europe reflected the strong Arab culture influence. Um, uh, if we look at the um, some of the housings uh, in uh, at the beginning, uh, Tbilisi was, yes, it was chaotic, but the chaos created uh, was very well arranged in this harsh relief. Uh, it created a character which shaped the lifestyle of the city. So someone once dwelling unit uh, uh, roof was another dwelling uh, yard, uh, yard. So it was very interwoven uh, structure, uh, uh, which uh, gave a special character, a character that was developed uh, during uh, like during time gradually. It wasn't created in, at once. So it was by centuries created. So it was, uh, I would say, an open system where people felt socially integrated and participated in this city formation process. Um, uh, the society felt the city belonged to them and they were able to morph based on the needs where interaction between social and material was possible, as McFrain would describe. Uh, so after Georgia in 18, uh, 1809 uh, was uh, became province of Russia, it went uh, uh, underwent major political economical changes and uh, uh, of course, the city structure was also very much influenced. Uh, from feudal city, Tbilisi became more a bourgeoisie city. Tbilisi turned its back to uh, Middle East style uh, development and was more influenced by European architecture and archi architects and architecture. And due to the fact that old part of the city was very dense, populated, the uh, structure you see here, uh, <coughs> Sorry. The landscape uh, was hard, uh, hard to change. A uh, new city area was developed next to, uh, next to it. So they didn't touch this old part. Um, so uh, after uh, uh, late 90s, uh, Tbilisi architecture style was drastically changed because uh, more uh, European style uh, buildings were built. So, uh, but uh, uh, what I want to emphasize is that uh, the assemblage, all different elements that was needed in the urban environment to function properly was fulfilled. It was unplanned uh, uh, with unplanned and spontaneous activities in the public uh, realm were possible and it was still kept as a heterogeneity. So the city was uh, living together with its inhabitants. When Soviets uh, uh, decided uh, or started to redevelop the city in 1934, uh, first master plan was prepared um, and it was prepared by, uh, was, there was two uh, proposals and one was done by Kharkov and Georgian architects. Uh, Kurdiani was uh, the head of the uh, uh, person from Tbilisi and one was done by Russian architects. So. Uh, some of the uh, people who actually developed the master plan, uh, they didn't know the character or the uh, the uh, culture so much. They never lived in the city. Uh, fortunately, the uh, the um, master plan, which was developed by Georgian and uh, Kharkov uh, city planners, was chosen. And uh, the main emphasis uh, during this time was given to um, uh, uh, to uh, improve uh, the housing shortage, which uh, was very important at that time for uh, Soviets uh, uh, to improve a microclimate uh, and to uh, uh, alleviate summer heat conditions, which uh, also is very questioning because uh, yes, they did uh, do a lot of uh, greening, but a lot of was not, never was done actually. And to develop industrial zones in the city and long 
it to the construction of uh, construct the infrastructure. Uh, very sad was that uh, in uh, during this time, the river, which was the main uh, line of the uh, so main uh, uh, element in the city, uh, uh, which created social life, and I I won't talk about it because I know that Mariam later will talk about this, uh, concentrate on this topic. Um, they. Uh, Destroy. Uh, they changed it uh, basically, and uh, they created a, a big highway on both sides of the river gradually. Uh, and it, uh, uh, yeah, it uh, lost connection. The city lost connection to the river. Um, but at the same time, they proposed to develop two uh, several uh, man-made lakes. So this is Lisi Sea, we call it, but it's a man-made lake. Uh, and also we have Lisi Lake here, which were uh, initiated uh, to improve the microclimate in Tbilisi and to uh, create a, a leisure uh, for uh, Tbilisi uh, dwellers. Uh, uh, and uh, uh, during uh, also this time, um, they tried to uh, position the housing units away from the main avenues, which was, which as Richard Sunet states, uh, is uh, quite a mistake when you are creating this such of environment. So you are kind of creating a bound border or boundary uh, between uh, this uh, formal and informal uh, space, public and uh, uh, private space. And uh, mm, this was uh, actually very much influenced uh, of Le Corbusier's idea of surrounding residential towers with the green to create an atmosphere of being close to the nature. However, yeah, this was, uh, 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 people tend to avoid such uh, open uh, spaces um, um, and it becomes no one's land, basically. Looking at the proposed master plan, the existing structure of Tbilisi, a relatively small area of the town was left untouched since it was uh, considered to be uh, a Soviet, not a Soviet city archetype, and it was functionally impossible to make any changes. Um, um, uh, and newly developed areas as predicted by critics of the new approach to planning and were not connected to the old city in terms of atmosphere or architecture. They became an independent regions without cultural, economical, social connection with this city center. Um, in the 50s, uh, 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 they continued to do the same as in uh, 1934, what was planned, but they uh, expanded and created uh, 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 several new regions which were uh, supposedly to move 40% of population from old city to new, uh, new um, housing areas. Parallel to uh, the proposal, um, uh, so what they did is uh, residential blocks were situated along the wide street with Stalinist architecture entrances from the front while the uh, space inside these blocks was hidden behind an interrupted facade. Each housing block prototype was given uh, by Soviet authorities. Uh, every block had to be 30 or 60 meters length with um, a four-story uh, building uh, and set back from the main avenue by seven and a half meters. Um, um, and so uh, these uh, regions were, these areas were all uh, created in throughout the city. Um, yeah, you can see the, uh, this is the, uh, taken from one of the uh, family archives. It's a um, uh, Stalinistic, uh, huge monumental buildings. Uh, and uh, 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 yeah, uh, they by similar to old master plan, uh, the uh, authorities divide and fracture the city into zones, uh, which 
certain time period due to lack of social elements became isolated areas. Due to the fact that new areas were isolated from city center, it was not possible to preserve the connection to the city culture, economical problem entities. Most of the dwellers in these new areas uh, sought to return to the city center, uh, while street buildings, green space and public areas were more open and accessible uh, for them. Elderly uh, remember that uh, they didn't want to go to this new uh, residential areas because they thought that you know, the scale uh, was uh, really different for them. Uh, there was no social connection. There was no, they felt that they were not integral, a great part of this new zone as they moved from winding narrow streets uh, to wide avenues, which did not encourage people to walk through them, develop activities or meet other people. Uh, people felt uh, very isolated from the wide avenues with Stalinistic facades. In 70s, uh, uh, again, we, uh, they keep doing uh, so dividing the uh, city by zones, so strictly uh, zones. So you have uh, residential areas, so you have industrial areas, um, and uh, uh, green areas, but they are all uh, kind of not interview and they're not connected to each other and they add uh, micro uh, micro regions to this but one thing that in 70s was uh, initiated uh, which was done, not done before uh, was the center uh, the um, center redesigning of uh, the city center uh, it was the first time that this uh, center was discussed not as, not as a street or a square but a system, a functional architectural special core of the city. Um, they wanted to create a, a, a linear uh, connection uh, to uh, dwelling units. So uh, I, I tried to show you here in red. Uh, so these were the uh, dwelling regions uh, which were separated from the city center, which was around here. And what they wanted is to uh, spread this and move it towards the man-made like the Stvilisi Sea and to uh, give ability uh, like uh, people to be like feel that they were in the, the city center so they were connected to the city they were not like I would say like a satellite cities um, yeah and uh, during 70s they also introduced uh, micro regions uh, micro regions were a little uh, free from planning, although they were also very uh, strictly pre-regulated and rigid structures, which even today uh, um, its inhabitants does not feel as part of the city. Uh, so I tried to put um, in three uh, columns here uh, what were the main components. So first, uh, create zones and standardize the city structure. Uh, remove the natural connection to the river uh, to uh, uh, create a, um, and parallel create the leisure lakes, which even today is not working properly, and create standardized housing blocks. In 50s, they did uh, continue all this and added, uh, uh, yeah, uh, they created. Uh, um, uh, this uh, isolated wide avenue monumental architecture again, and in the 70s, they created micro regions. So uh, if we look at the uh, Senet suggestion, uh, what, how the uh, city, livable city should be, he um, says that there are three components to consider while talking about it, is ambiguous edges between part of the city in complete forms that can change and transform during certain periods of time and unresolved narrative. Uh, uh, Similar to modernist architecture, Soviet followed a linear city design approach with strictly positioning functional zones and to avoid time in transport. Although it was said that time was intended to ensure the rational um, location and staging of both housing and employment node, it was very well uh, thought segregation process where different social groups were aged in a specific 
border as hermetically sealed, uh, socially disconnected and segregated um, districts based on status, profession and workplace. By creating functional zones, the city was divided into clusters that created an equal and socially disconnected regions and artificial, as um, Christopher Alexander says, and uh, and segregated social systems. Nothing can happen spontaneously or without planning ahead. This you know, city is like a stopped organism that does not evolve or change during certain time um, due to strict regulations. Um, and uh, as we see in uh, the proposals, uh, uh, Soviets designed the city from ground zero, placed uh, on uh, entirely on a new foundation with, without considering its history and tradition of that society. Uh, as Lefebvre argues, the architects, the planner and sociologist and philosopher or the politician cannot out of nothingness uh, create a new form and relations. It has to be natural process, which can not only regulate by a certain group of people. Unfortunately, that it was uh, not the case in Soviet city planning process. The process was political and ideological where cities became battlegrounds rather than um, in entities that supported the social structures and everyday lives of their inhabitants. Tbilisi became uh, a city that reflected Soviet ideology and did not serve its inhabitants. Mm, uh, so, so, uh, um, and so, uh, Tbilisi structure configuration was changed significantly considering the city's development relief and character. The standardization and cultural loss identity and covered, se covered segregation of populace led to the creation of fractured city even after decades uh, of political and economical changes in the post-Soviet era. Tbilisi remains as a closed system. Uh, and to sum up, the openness of pre-Soviet Tbilisi was destroyed in its, uh, in its urban development. The city is a, com a concrete, practical experience, a place of its residents who use it and appropriate it in their everyday practices. The nature of a city is something that its inhabitants learn from infancy and something they combine with their memories. Uh, this is the quote from uh, Schmidt uh, in Planetary Urbanism. Uh, I created a, sm a small a visual, uh, also a diagram, uh, where I pu put uh, open city components, uh, which are multifunctional, ambiguous edges, evolution, unresolved narrative dialogue, incomplete for and porosity. And then I try to find uh, where was the Soviet city, how I would describe it, and uh, if there was a connection. And unfortunately, most of the connections I found in, were in the closed system description uh, made by Richard Sennett. Um, yeah, I think, uh, yeah, this is uh, my short uh, presentation of what I have been working on. I think it would be good to uh, ask questions because I did, I can't put everything in a short time. I was, uh, I think I don't have enough time. <laughs> Thank you. Thanks, Ia. Thank you so much. Uh, yeah, um, Gwen and Norman, mm -hmm. do you have questions? No, we're just clapping hands. Just clapping up. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> Um, yeah, uh, yeah, that was a beautiful presentation on kind of this overview of, of how Tbilisi has developed. Uh, sorry, my camera's off. Um, yeah, uh, yeah, um, I mean, just from my kind of my architectural background, I'm, I, I think of Lagos. Mm -hmm. in Nigeria as a city that that has kind of developed uh, in a kind of an open system in a way um, mm -hmm. where where the state has kind of intervened in certain places to to kind of uh, encourage growth of the city um, in a kind of a dynamic way so they've uh, 
I think it was in the 80s or the 90s, they've, they've implemented bits of infrastructure that enabled kind of a, the openness of that city to, to develop. So, so there is obviously like a relationship between the, the government and then, um, and then also the people. So there's like, there's not like this strict, very strict planning and then, and this very monofunctional kind of planning. Mm -hmm. it's, it's kind of this dynamic relationship which, yeah, I imagine, you know, kind of the future of Tbilisi and, and is this more kind of into, or this porous, I think there's a word that you use, this porous mm -hmm. nature of the two, yeah. Yes, it's uh, Soviet, in Soviet times, uh, it was so much strictly regulated where should be what and how big or how long or what's the height uh, so that, uh, um, and uh, of also the monofunctioning. Uh, so there were only uh, houses and kindergarten and school. Yes, there were school and kindergarten, but uh, these people had no... Um, they had to go to the city center for a theater, for a cinema, for uh, other activities. Uh, and uh, uh, it was, um, yeah, very, very structured. I, I don't know what's, what's the, um, where is the, uh, like, a line, how much you should plan uh, and how much you should leave it for uh, uh, inter, uh, for in as the Senate right, incomplete form, how much you have to leave for uh, it. Um, but uh, yeah, it's, um, <laughs> uh, but it, it, in Soviet, like Soviet Pilisi, I think was very much strictly regulated and very close to system, which even like nothing, no, none of the buildings could have been built without Russian authorities uh, approval. N none of the, uh, every building or every master pro proposal had to go through uh, Russian authorities. Yes, it was developed in Georgia. It was uh, discussed in Georgia and the architects were most, well, most of them, but they always had a supervisor from uh, Soviet authorities. Uh, for example, in uh, yeah, every time, uh, and Politburo had to say, okay, this could be done, and very little, uh, yeah, there are some buildings which were not um, like a standard buildings, so there are, yeah, some of, a few of them, very a few, but they had to go very straight to uh, uh, discussion and uh, uh, visits in Moscow and talking. We have one of the buildings which I uh, researched so, and uh, the architect told me that he had to go in Moscow a few times and he had to cut the budget as much as he could in order to be built this building. And uh, fortunately it was built and it's a very nice building uh, in Tbilisi and um, different building. Uh, I mean, uh, could be for someone it could be ugly but uh, for that time it was different and something uh yeah this i think it was unique in this way but everything was very strictly um uh, guided by uh, soviet authorities i think someone had a question or yes Leila in the chat let me see. Thank you, yeah, for a great presentation. Close city is definitely not how I, I as a visa would describe my Tbilisi experience. Although, of course, most of it was in post-Soviet period. I was wondering if you could perhaps comment on the way in which residents subverted the rigid planning and appropriated urban space in Soviet times. Um, um, I don't know if they uh, sub subverted or uh, sub changed, right? So if I understand correctly, how they changed it, uh, and uh, I don't know if they appropriated urban space in Soviet times. After Soviet times in '90s, so a lot was changed. A lot had uh, 
um, was uh, done by uh, individuals. And uh, we have kamikaze logia, we call them the expansions uh, of the houses which were done, that was done in the 90s. And uh, that's also very interesting, uh, but it's, uh, I think, the result of Soviet planning uh, to strictly limit the size of the housing units and then uh, all of a sudden give a uh, permission um, uh, to uh, residents, okay, now you can expand, now you can change uh, your uh, housing and uh, most of the, uh, in the micro uh, rayons or um, uh, a region, uh, right, regions that were done in Stalin era, they also, they, they have expansions, uh, not the high rise, very like nine, build, nine level of buildings they don't have, but the uh, five, seven uh, levels, they have this extension. So, and that was really changed. And, um, but uh, I think during Soviet time, there was uh, not, uh, nothing appropriated in urban space. <laughs> yes, Stefan. Stefan. I, thank you very much. Uh, first of all, for your really good explanations for me, but it was quite interesting because I don't know to this quite well, but I've been there five or six times, uh, so mm -hmm. in a little, the city a little bit. Um, I've been there now. Uh, in, uh, in Yerevan happened something, uh, Andre explained to us, and in, for example, that means they, uh, in a way, they've destroyed completely um, the, the Russian part of the city or, or, or the buildings from the beginning of the 19th century and the end mm -hmm. of uh, from the 19th century or beginning of the 20th century. Um, do you see such a comparable development in Tbilisi as well, or uh, are, in a way, these buildings from the 19th and 19th beginning 20th century, in a way, protected because mm -hmm. uh, they are important for uh, the attraction of, uh, of Tbilisi for, uh, as a touristic Place mm -hmm. and I have to admit that I was quite surprised they did this so strictly in Baku and Yerevan because uh, Baku wanted to uh, go with tourism as well. They simply destroyed everything. Mm -hmm. Do you see a comparable or a slightly comparable mm -hmm. development in Tbilisi? Yeah, thank you very much. Uh, um... I think uh, there were a few uh, um, tries uh, to to uh, uh, destroy, uh, but I think the uh, activists were very strong, uh, and uh, we tried to um, keep uh, uh, some parts. Or if uh, there was one building, for example, they uh, they constructed it, uh, um, and. Uh, um, they are going to rebuild it uh, based on uh, the old uh, uh, drawings, uh, but I don't I don't remember that there was such a harsh uh, like a destroy and rebuild uh, contemporary building. There uh, there is one which has uh, you probably know this uh, hotel uh, on the backside of the uh, this building on Rustaveli Avenue, uh, but. The building itself was not destroyed. Um, maybe the architecture lost its uh, scale, and uh, architectural historians would be uh, can talk about it much more. Uh, but um, uh, it wasn't fully destroyed, uh, and uh, I I was actually surprised when um, uh, Andre said that uh, said that uh, the fully destroyed and rebuilt the new ones. I, I don't think that Felici has this. And uh, actually a lot of, uh, we have a very good uh, activists uh, uh, who are um, really fighting for uh, certain buildings.
Thank you. You are welcome. Cool. Thanks. You're welcome. Um, we will move on to Stefan's presentation. Our next speaker, Stefan Atlas, um, an associate professor of geography and didactics at the University of Munster in Germany. Uh, in his current human geography research project, he is investigating the influence of tourist practices on the Svaneti region in Georgia. He is also working on a digital archive of transition of the cultural space of Svaneti in collaboration with colleagues from German and Georgian universities. Um, please find links to Stefan's work in the document uh, shared in the chat box. I'll put that link again and then you can find all those links um, to Stefan's work. Um, but yeah, uh, to you, Stefan. Okay, uh, first of all, um, first of all, I have to say I'm on a conference here and I have to find a place where the internet is working in a way. So um, if you, if there are people come up running behind me, so don't wonder, uh, I'm here at the desk of the conference because it's the best place for the internet. Okay, first of all, uh, many thanks to Darren for the invitation, certainly I'm very pleased um, to be able to create a project that uh, will take my colleagues and me to Georgia and Svaneti twice next year. It's called Vibrant Spaces of Svaneti and deals with the diverse ideas that exist about this uh, space Svaneti in and outside of Georgia. Uh, just briefly about myself, I'm a teacher, educationalist and geographer and in my geography related work academic work, I'm concerned with tourism practices. Um, I first came to Ushkuli uh, in Svaneti uh, in 2015. Here on this picture you see Ushkuli, the most photographed place maybe in Georgia, uh, at a time when tourism was clearly beginning to develop in Georgia. Tourism, uh, which is really booming worldwide, is generally seen as having great potential for the future. On the one hand, perhaps to make Georgia's um, yeah, special character clear to the non-Georgian world, and perhaps also affirm the special as a georgian as to the people of the country uh, as well. And you can see this quite well in the way Georgia's tourism marketing uh, is designed. Uh, moreover, tourism has as well uh, the function of establishing a connection to the right, which is necessarily, necess certainly necessary uh, as a country. Uh, what is most important for the everyday life of Georgians is that uh, they get by tourism an additional source of income uh, for which the state doesn't have to take over responsibility. And uh, in my perception, tourism in Georgia is a kind of extension of uh, subsistence agriculture in peripheral areas. And uh, this, this sort of tourism releases the state from having to provide for social services, for example. Uh, I wrote uh, a small piece about that for Eurasian Net uh, uh, in 2018. Now, my first impression of 2015 was mainly um, when I came there that I couldn't read, could not understand the cultural worlds that opened up to me there. You see, you see a photograph of 1910, uh, 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 this typical architecture of the region. Um, um, I had somehow the feeling that both uh, the locals uh, and the tourists did not really communicate with each other, or better, they were not really able to get in touch with each other uh, without creating permanent crisis of misunderstanding uh, and uh, moreover I had the impression that uh, even the people I identified as locals in Swaneti that these people were made up of, up of highly diverse groups uh, and I was able to witness that in between the locals uh, or the different groups of locals, um, uh, the, the interaction between was also uh, characterized by strong mistrust. Uh, these were 
the initial periods, uh, of a research process that has brought me to Svaneti every, every year since 2015, then apart from last year, certainly. Uh, my access to the field uh, in my work in Georgia, um, I follow a geographical ethnographic approach. This means uh, that questions about how people relate to each other within the spaces and the places, uh, these questions, they are central to me. I'm interested in how they create their realities and what meanings also, what strong values they attribute uh, to them. Uh, this is important for tourism practices uh, because tour pra tourism practices require, always require a kind of reinterpretation of places, places and objects. Even uh, if the people involved are often not aware of, uh, of this, that they are doing this. Uh, an example would be the tourist expectations, for example, they require, they require the, that the providers of tourist services, that they begin to consider which everyday practices they do, such, for example, as tilling a field or milking a cow or something like that, which of these practices they have to stage uh, as something extraordinary in order to attract the interest of their guests. This would be an example of reinterpreting um, spaces and practices. Um, so, how did I go about of what was going on, what was happening in Svaneti, apart from doing literature research and reading, certainly? Uh, I traveled to Svaneti once or twice a year from 2015 to 2020, photographing. Uh, the built space and the unbuilt space there, visiting the same families over and over again, conducting interviews and asking people what meanings they assign to practices, objects, places, and spaces. Um, first of all, I tried to trace uh, the architectural development of the space from the pre-Soviet period, the Soviet building period, and the developments in the 1990s, and then from around 2010 when the tourists development took off. Um, accordingly, uh, I mapped the whole of Ushkuli and uh, recorded the structural situation. Uh, you have to, to see that there uh, doesn't exist any map of Ushkuli from Chachashi, the UNESCO World Heritage Village. Uh, the rest is not mapped. Um, for example, which buildings uh, were built or rebuilt in which phase and what logic the rebuilding followed. This led to a typification of the house modifications, which you can see here, for example, uh, and the new buildings, especially from the Soviet era, as the Soviet era uh, uh, represents the dominant architectural structure uh, on site, uh, seen away from Chashi here, uh, the UNESCO um, uh, village. Um, again and again, uh, or to do this, I mainly visited the village community fully in spring, summer, autumn, and winter, just to get to know uh, the everyday practices and how they are performed uh, inside places and spaces. Um, and uh, again and again, the question was what it understand oneself uh, as a Swan or as a member of the school communities it was about. Um, uh, finding out what relation there is between modernity and tradition against uh, uh, against the backdrop of a tourism that changing rapidly changing the known world for the people on the ground. So, in a nutshell, it was about ideas of the own, the other, or the foreign. Um, at the same time, I dealt uh, with the ideas of the tourists, uh, certainly uh, who visited Svaneti. On the one hand, within interviews on the spot, um, and on the other hand, uh, through the analysis of blog entries, comments uh, on booking platforms for accommodation, offers of travel agencies, um, and so on. And uh, through the contact, for example, with uh, uh, experts uh, in Svaneti, as Nino Zerdian, the, uh, the director of the Svaneti Museum of History and Ethnography. I was able then to broaden my perspectives and learn more about local interests behind an interest in expanding uh, tourist practices. Uh, here, two further small contributions, uh, contributions on these issues, one for Eurasianet again and another for Georgia Today, an English newspaper being published in Georgia. Uh, my conclusion, uh, I wrote about these in a, scholar, in a scholarly article shown here. 
short before attempts to promote the development of the region from outside or to preserve the cultural heritage will end in unsustainable development because uh, the specific uh, conditions on the the specific social uh, conditions and political conditions on the ground, um, and they won't make this possible. Uh, perhaps I thought the only way to achieve somehow a sustainable development was to get as many local actors as possible in contact with interested visitors. Uh, so um, I finally gave up, gave up the idea of writing a scholarly book on Ushkuli at first. Uh, which had originally been my plan. This is what I wanted to, to do. Uh, because it was clear to me that in the end, I wouldn't be able to gain a significant readership by a scholarly book um, uh, for these problems. Uh, what I initially then wanted to contribute was a geographic ethnographic travel guide that incorporates uh, the results of my research. Uh, in this way, I would like to provide a kind of framework so that travelers interested in sustainability uh, can learn more about the region than they can through the, the usual uh, travel guides you have uh, and travel platforms. And this uh, travel guide will be published in German in October next month and in English next year, probably in May. Um, this was what I could do on myself uh, to, to uh, to help perhaps or, or get in contact with, uh, with solving some of these problems. Uh, now to our, uh, to our uh, project, Vibrant Spaces of Svaneti. Um, in order to bring them skate, uh, stakeholders from the region and beyond into contact, um, I approached two German colleagues, Professor Sebastian Franz from the Media University in Stuttgart and Dr. Stefan Buell from the Center of Conflict uh, research in Marburg and uh, both of them they already have implemented successful projects in Georgia and have been familiar with the country for several several years uh, and both already have networks in Georgia here's some of uh, people we are working with uh, in the fields of anthropology architecture and media design and they have experience in working with students from different uh, disciplines. The German Heinrich Böll Foundation uh, with its office in Tbilisi has agreed to support our project start next year and the first workshops financially and the staff and other resources um, and we will there in, in spring in Tbilisi first and then in August and some native students from Georgia and, uh, uh, and Germany. Um, and we are certainly very happy to work with these foundations as the foundation is particularly strong in the field of sustainability. Sustainability. Um, Migrant Spaces of Svaneti aims first of all uh, to collect local interests and uh, to present people's stories in so called so called transmedia uh, archive. As I already has said, and uh, we will start in 2022 and aim to pursue uh, the following goals you can see here. Hopefully, in a work um, uh, over several years, uh, the aim is. Uh, to bring uh, together the relevant stakeholders in the region so that a discourse on a sustainable form of tourism in the region can emerge. By sustainable tourism, we mean tourism that is interested in local history and culture. We would like to create a digital platform to collect and archive local narratives. And in combination with this platform and events in Svaneti and Tbilisi, we aim to create a public forum for the region's concerns and a public archive to document and safeguard Svaneti's rich material, culture, local practices, and uses of space. Um, by creating this transmedia archive, at, uh, yeah, we, we call it at the interface between journalistic storytelling and museum representation. We want to offer an open approach to storytelling and this allows us to present different kinds of material and it offers space for different interpretations uh, by collecting, for example, personal narratives, biographical content such as family pictures and objects for religious and cultural purposes, maps and plans, uh, which are documenting layers of architectural use um, and so on. So. Uh, with our, our project, uh, we are, are at first trying to set a counterpoint to widespread stereotypes um, about the region. Uh, we are planning 
in our first uh, rough draft, we are planning several annual joint workshops with students. Uh, said from Porsche in Germany uh, on the following topics. Uh, a workshop shall be about narratives of futures and fate, uh, collecting Swan biographies. Uh, one workshop uh, shall be then about material cultures, collecting photographs of objects and images, uh, showing how these objects and images um, are communicating with the space around them and with the people using them. Uh, and then a kind of mapping uh, of the past. This is the architectural part. Uh, we to show how the space is used, how it has been changed uh, through constructions, reconstructions through different uh, ages on on this uh, in this transmedia archive. Yes, uh, that's it from my side already now <laughs> just to give you an overview uh, thank you for your interest um, i've already sent darren um, the presentation um, where you will also find further references to my work to our project um, if you are interested thanks fantastic thank you stefan uh, any comments from the chat I have. I think it's very interesting. And uh, Stefan, if you, uh, I don't know if you already have students from Georgia or not, so uh, um, we can uh, try to collaborate. Uh, we had a project uh, actually with Politecnico de Milano to um, try and uh, study Svanetti and uh, yeah, in a, yeah. Uh, um, more um, uh, rehabilitation, reconstruction uh, part, uh, uh, but unfortunately the, due to COVID, uh, we were not able to continue and I hope that soon we will restart the project. <laughs> so uh, it would... Thank you very much for, for, yeah. for this invitation because uh, I already wanted to invite you uh, mm -hmm. uh, in spring when we Tivoli, so we decide to bring together as many people as possible uh, yeah. to work, yeah. uh, about uh, about uh, the situation there in, uh, mm -hmm. in, in Svaneti. So I would be, if you can uh, get in touch uh, by mail or so, mm -hmm. I'd be very glad yes. to, to meet you. Yeah, <laughs> I, I am. Because the, yes. Yeah. Uh, the, the, um, uh, I've been working in, in, in Georgia now for five years, uh, mm -hmm. but I don't speak any Georgian. I speak Russian, okay. um, and that means that uh, uh, and that means that uh, I, I can certainly communicate with everybody being as you know. So in 1990, uh, everything yeah. changed, uh, and I can read the. The, the literature in Russian uh, about the architecture and as well about the act architecture's changes. But uh, in Soviet time, uh, as you certainly know, just to say to the other ones, um, Svaniti certainly was um, uh, seen as an under, underdeveloped place. So uh, in Soviet times, there was not so much research about, uh, uh, about the traditional architecture. Yes. Uh, but I know that there uh, is a lot of work in, written in Georgian, but unfortunately, I can't read it. <laughs> so uh, I think we should, uh, should bring as many resources together as possible. Yeah, we will be glad to. Uh, we should keep in touch. Uh, I will be in Germany till uh, end of February, but then uh, I am back and we can collaborate. You will be in Germany? Yes. Uh, and then we should meet perhaps earlier. <laughs> <laughs> okay, we can communicate with email <laughs> and see, yes, if it's possible. <laughs> Great. <laughs> I love, the, I love the connection that, that's <laughs> forming right now. <laughs> um, no, fantastic. I mean, it's a, it's a beautiful project. Um, and it's, it's really interesting to see the kind of the theories um, or like this kind of academic uh, approach, but also now implemented into the actual practice, which is a very 
um, it's fascinating to see how theory and practice kind of come together. Um, and obviously, it's, it will develop over the many years. Um, but yeah, it's fa fa yeah, fascinating. Uh, I, I just, just to say a word about that, um, uh, because um, the point is uh, you you have a lot of travel guide, uh, guides, uh, but none of them is especially about Svaniti. And what you can read about Svaniti is quite stereotype stuff. And uh, the idea was to make a book uh, that uh, follows scholarly rules in a way. So uh, in this book, you can if you say uh, you read something and if you want to uh, understand in a deeper way, then there's always a link for an article or for a book or anything uh, else. And uh, this was simply the idea. And Svaneti has had 100,050 visitors in 2019. This is simply too much for the whole region within one year. Uh, and none of them has information or clear information about the very critical uh, ecological situation them there, the very critical social situation as well and I think many of these visitors they are interested in getting in a in serious in a kind of serious context with, uh, with people living there and uh, but there's simply no uh, no possibility to do that so that was the idea first a travel guide in German and English and then an open platform that can be used as as a kind of guide and and um, by this platform you can in a way get in contact with with people living on, on the ground, uh, which are telling their life stories, for example. And we thought that this could be a form of uh, uh, promoting a better understanding for the conditions um, in, in the region. Yeah, I mean, I, I like, I'm, I'm kind of thinking, I'm thinking of, uh, and I'm sure in your studies you've, You've assessed other places that have almost exploded in tourism, for example, Italy or uh, what do they say, the Swiss Alps or those regions that, that, that are almost over touristic now. Um, and, and now almost in Ushguli and Svaneti, there's this chance to now um, readdress some of those over touristic uh, kind of issues that are are happening currently. Um, yeah. But yeah, I mean, thank you, Stefan. Uh, we thank you very much. Yeah. I have another um, question, if I may. Ruben, yes. So, yeah, thank you very much again, Stefan. As you saw, the, uh, or as you know already, Caucasus is a jungle of languages, and without local, uh, it's not. Uh, possible to make a comprehensive studies. Uh, so we are also happy that our, our session also makes new networks like you and Ia just made. Um, my question is rather anthropological and I'm sorry, the connection was very poor. So I missed some of your sentences. Uh, so apologies if, if you have to repeat it, but um, so we are in a very, very high mountainous area, right, Svanetia? And you, you illustrated the changes of recent years in the regions. And you also mentioned that the, there is some kind of uh, mistrust between locals and foreigners, even, even Georgians, uh, which, is, which is totally understandable and very typical for this kind of uh, high mountainous areas and as far as you show the the cultural landscape also changes to, throughout the years in Svanetia. So my question would be is there a, a significant headwind from locals against these changes and how are they manifested? <laughs> This is quite complicated. <laughs> uh, in, in the 1990s, uh, the Georgian state lost control over the region. Uh, this was a result of the wars in Abkhazia and South Ossetia as well. And um, uh, Svaneti saw uh, certainly a lot of people um, fleeing uh, Abkhazia and, uh, and, and migrating to Svaneti. 
this. I mean, people from Georgia can ex could explain that certainly better than I can do it. Uh, a lot of weapons uh, as well in into the region. And uh, finally, uh, because of uh, the civil war process and everything, in short, the, the state lost control over the region. And this means that uh, in the 1990s, um, many people in the villages, they simply got stuck there. They couldn't move uh, forward or backward and uh, they had a very difficult life there. Uh, um, uh, but many of the people already um, uh, emigrated from the region in the end of the of 1980s. That means half of the population moved to the south of Tbilisi uh, uh, because there were um, avalanche catastrophes, uh, avalanche catastrophes, too much snow catastrophes, and so on. Uh, but um, uh, in the beginning of the 2000s, from 2010 on, I think the situation was quite fine for the people who stayed in the region uh, because they had the possibility to, to earn a little bit more money by tourism. Uh, but um, when uh, relatives or other swans who had already uh, moved to the south of, of Georgia, when they saw that it was, was possible to, to earn money uh, there in the mountains, uh, they started to move back in summer. Uh, and uh, then, in a way, the, uh, the, the battle for the tourists began. And as you certainly know, uh, 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 if you are uh, in, in a very uh, precarious situation, and uh, nearly everybody in Georgia is in a precarious situation, uh, up to 50% of the population, they have to do agriculture in any way, uh, just to uh, enough to eat during, uh, during the year, uh, then it does make a difference uh, if you can earn some money more. Uh, by tourism or not, because if you can earn a little bit more money, this means that you can send your children for can't, then you can't in the end. Uh, so this is uh, one, one aspect of the mistrust. Uh, another aspect is that uh, the stereotypes about the region uh, uh, that uh, they um, that tourists expect in a way something like uh, um, a life that has been like that the people lived a kind of life that have been living 100 and 200 years ago. And with the stereotypes, certain expectations. But if you go to a to village in Svaneti, it's quite uh, possible that, uh, uh, that uh, the guest house, the people living there, that they are academics, for example. <laughs> in Ushkuli, half of the people have an academic degree. Because in Soviet times, <laughs> uh, they were studying in Tbilisi, then they had work in, in the 1980s, and uh, then they had to move back, for example, and didn't have any, uh, any resources. So um, this mistrust between the people, with, which is, in, in, as I can read it, a result of, especially a result of the 1990s, this mistrust is living on up till today, and it's getting severe. Uh, because uh, of more of more people, uh, for more and more tourists uh, wanting to visit uh, visit the region, and uh, uh, they uh, they weren't able up to today, as I can see it, to 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 come together and uh, to talk about how they want to use their space, and this is a thing they cannot use by the help of any foreigners or, or so. This is absolutely not possible. The people living there, they have to solve this problem. Um, but uh, during the years I've been visiting Swaneti now, uh, this kind of mistrust is so strong that uh, the different groups are simply not coming together because they are uh, for the possibility uh, of earning uh, money uh, through tourism. And uh, I think this is something that only in a conversation uh, between Georgians can be solved in a way. This cannot be solved by any NGO or so, um, because um, any NGO projects or so, they come into the region like a helicopter for two or three years and then leave the region. This is absolutely not possible. Without understanding the spe 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 specific social processes, I think it's not possible to, uh, to gain something like uh, sustainability in this region. And this is why this can't work without bringing swans together and talking about what they want to do and what we are, something like a framework. 
This is what we perhaps can do with the help or of many, many other people, not from outside of Georgia, but from Georgia. Perfect. Thank you so much, Stefan. We really appreciate that. Yeah. Uh, in 2005, Mariam Erdia graduated with a master's, degree, master's program in cultural studies at the School of Philosophy and Sociology of Ivan Javakishvili State University of Tbilisi. The topic of her master's thesis was globalization and Georgian culture. In 2012, she graduated from the MA program in development management at Ruhr University Russian in Germany with her master's thesis, The Role of Culture in Conflict Prevention and Resolution, Case Study, Georgia. Current professional practice of Ms. Urdia is connected to the field of environmental protection and it involves integration of social and cultural dimensions. For example, the awareness raising gender equality and gender roles, sustainable development principles. In the field of nature conservation and sustainable management of natural resources. Uh, yeah, thank you so much, Mary. Thank you, Darren. Uh, yes, uh, good evening, everyone. Um, and thank you again, Darren, for the invitation and for organization of the seminar. Uh, currently, I'm a uh, PhD student uh, of the Cultural and uh, Social Anthropology program uh, at Ilya State University of Tbilisi. And today I would like to um, uh, present my uh, research project and the name of the project is Mtkvari as a Human Nature Assemblage. Uh, the wider uh, topic of my research uh, is uh, human nature connectedness or uh, disconnectedness uh, with the focus on urban space. The wider conceptual um, uh, framework uh, is set by the concept of anthropocene, which is uh, characterized with the uh, irreversible modifications of uh, natural environment due to anthropogenic factors. Uh, well, my case study is Tbilisi, and uh, I have selected Mtkvari uh, River as one of the central uh, biophysical systems of the city. Um, I'm interested to uh, observe uh, and explore uh, the transformations uh, River Mtkvari uh, has gone through during the last centuries, uh, transformations which uh, actually uh, resulted uh, from Tuari from being so-called mother river for the city or the first architect of the city to the lost and forgotten river uh, uh, today. So uh, my objective, my main objective is to uh, identify and analyze multi-layer and multifunctional nature of Tuari before and after large infrastructural projects. And those pro projects mainly date back to mid 20th century and uh, are associated with the, uh, uh, the so-called uh, Soviet modernism era. Respectively, my main research questions uh, are as follows. Could we say that uh, Kvari Riva has become the product and at the same time, the uh, agent or the negotiator of the Soviet ideology? And if yes, what uh, were the transformative effects of the Soviet city planning? Uh, what were the pronounced or uh, hidden in uh, intentions of the large infrastructural projects of Amtkwari? And what are the uh, results of those projects? What are the layers of, uh, of the river which we have lost or uh, which are muted for now, or, and which are the layers uh, which are uh, which are still allowed. Uh, together with the historical perspective, I also uh, concentrate at present and also try to integrate uh, future perspective with the uh, following questions. Can we identify signs of modern ideology in current city planning on the example of, uh, on the example of uh, embankment planning? And how does this ideology look like? Uh, and what is the relationship between the river and the city currently? 
uh, I, I would like to explore whether there is any potential to revive this relationship and to somehow bring back uh, the uh, river to the city and uh, its residents. And the theoretical framework, like the theoretical lenses uh, I'm using, is mainly uh, connected to actor network theory. The main idea of which is to uh, to like rethink and widen uh, the um, concept of social by bringing in the uh, non to, together with human actors, non-human actors, uh, and in this case, such actors as nature and uh, infrastructure, and uh, explore uh, their role together with again together with human actors in creation and recreation of social networks. My methodology is based on combination of uh, several methods. Uh, these methods are uh, participant observation with elements of collaborative uh, research, then different types of interviews uh, from informal interviews uh, uh, and unstructured interviews to semi-structured interviews, and of course, archival work. So I'll be, I'm looking at uh, periodicals, um, from newspapers to specialized journals, and of course, uh, photo and uh, video materials and so forth. Uh, I have to say that I'm uh, still at quite an initial phase of my research. I basically started the actual field work uh, just in September. Uh, however, uh, the preliminary findings or preliminary observations uh, are, quite interesting already and uh, kind of validate my research questions and give already the first impressions which I want to share with you. So I, I mentioned that uh, I'm interested to explore multi-layer and multifunctional nature of the weaver uh, it used to have and probably partially still has for the city and its residents. Uh, here you see photos um, uh, depicting mainly uh, Tbilisi towards the end of 19th and beginning of 20th century. And the first uh, left photo shows well why the, why the river was uh, considered to be the first architect of the city. Uh, I think uh, the uh, photo demonstrates how it designs the main, like the central, Central one of the central parts of the uh, of the city. Uh, this photo also shows um, famous water mills, which for many centuries, for ten centuries basically, for starting from tenth century to uh, mid twentieth century, um, were very important um, part of city's economic and social life. Um, uh, but unfortunately, uh, they are vanished. Uh, for for today, yeah, then the um, then the uh, next photo demonstrates uh, like transportation function of Tkwari. We can see so called uh, Muhranis Boradi, which is uh, which was the boat, but uh, not like a touristic boat. We uh, still have in Tbilisi, but real transportation means, which was connecting two banks and respectively two parts of the city. And uh, on the right hand side, we see the laundry uh, arranged arranged on, uh, on one of the banks of the river near Metaxi Cliff. Uh, yeah, here uh, we see again Metaxi uh, Cliff surroundings with old Metaxi Bridge. Uh, we see the uh, fishermen, uh, and I have to say that fishing uh, was one of the again one of the very important. Um, economic activity uh, in uh, Old Felici and fish from Tkwari was one of the food sources for the city and the re city's residents. And uh, on the right hand side we see uh, the photo demonstrates kind of recreational uh, or uh, yeah, recreational function of the river, people, mainly children, bathing. Uh, bathing on, uh, on one of the banks of the river, again with a near Metehi, famous Metehi cliff. Uh, uh, this function was kept a little bit longer. This photo is from the late 40s. Uh, well, as uh, 
British anthropologist Carolyn Humphrey states, uh, ideology does not uh, exist only in linguistic forms, but it also appears in, uh, uh, in material structures. And after, uh, after revolution, uh, uh, architecture became one of the main scenes or one of the main arenas uh, for Soviet ideology to be realized. And I think uh, the developments of Amtkwari uh, demonstrate quite vividly or in very, so to say, concentrated way, um, these, um, these statements. Uh, soon, after the, soon after the Sovietization of Georgia, uh, which happened in uh, 1921, uh, one of the, not one of the, but the, actually the first largest infrastructural project was um, implemented over Mtkwari, and that was um, Zahesi hydropower plant, which was opened in 1927. And uh, that was, uh, yeah, that was one of the, uh, I would say, one of the examples or uh, like expressions of uh, Motos of uh, Soviet ideology, uh, uh, like uh, uh, of taming nature or gaining victory over nature, and that was really an important, very important project. Also, also treated very importantly on the uh, on the photo, uh, on the right photo, you can see even Stalin visiting the uh, visiting the construction works uh, before opening the um, hydropower plant. Uh, in 1930s, uh, uh, construction of uh, embankment highway started, and uh, yeah, the first photo illustrates the construction works, and then uh, we see the rest of the slide just shows the first first results of the of the um, beautified embankment. Uh, yes. Um, uh, initial uh, pedestrian zones were definitely larger and over time this uh, we will see also I think uh, in later photos that this pedestrian zone shrinked over time. Well uh, then the beautification of the of the um, city and uh, in more concentrated uh, way uh, banks of the river um, were kept all this beautification trend. This photo, by the way, was provided by Ian. Thanks uh, for this again, that I think very well shows also this like uh, aspirations uh, towards beautification, towards kind of glorification of the Soviet uh, ideology. As far as I know, not all the elements, architectural elements were realized, but most of them uh, uh, turned into a true um, uh, architecture of the of the uh, left embankment and then in result uh, I just uh, I just wanted to also show those uh, photos how the uh, riverscape and uh, uh, accordingly the cityscape uh, was reshaped uh, at also at, a, at a very first glance uh, the first photo is from 80s while the second one I took a few months ago this summer uh, and um, in important for me important uh, element also in this last photo like the photo below is that uh, the connection between uh, city and uh, uh, city and the river is uh, that, that the connection is physic even physically lost I think is demonstrated also on this photo it's basically accessible only for cars there are a very few passages for pedestrians to cross the highway and it's really hard to get on the embankment closer to the river. Oh, well, ideas to improve, um, I was positively surprised to uh, find out that in 2016, there were some uh, discussions, even uh, a concept uh, prepared for the uh, upcoming uh, master plan of Tbilisi to, uh, to um, reshape the embankments so, or uh, bring them uh, at least partially back to close to natural uh, conditions, uh, and uh, the idea was to uh, to yeah to free the uh, to free the parts of both embankments uh, from uh, concrete and then create a network of the parks uh, 
covering all in all uh, throughout city from its west uh, uh, border to the east about 500 um, uh, hectares. But unfortunately, this concept uh, never ended in the official, official, at least in this uh, shape, never ended into the uh, official um, uh, master plan, which was approved in 2019. But still, uh, like this, uh, even existence of such ideas at concept or draft concept level gives a little bit of hope that uh, certain uh, changes uh, are possible uh, still. Uh, I, in the end, I just very quickly would like to uh, present the uh, like my uh, field site. So my basically my field con consists. It's in a way multi-sited, but I have uh, micro sites identified along with Paridiva, which in my opinion are uh, interesting. Basically according to two criteria, like close to nature conditions, and then uh, according to the level of involvement in social life. One of such is so-called the Romy Meadows. It's uh, uh, at the entrance uh, of the city from, near the entrance of the city from the west, um, uh, and it covers around two, uh, 200 uh, hectares. Well, the area is important. Uh, it's, as I said, it's close to nature, uh, or close to natural conditions, it's rich in biodiversity, um, and it's uh, uh, thanks to that it's uh, a great uh, recreational potential. Contains great recreational potential, but at the same time it faces uh, serious challenges like illegal um, excavation of uh, riverbed uh, and lake bed uh, resources and uh, illegal dump. It's kind of a illegal dumping site and so forth. Uh, then the second interesting spot uh, uh, for my project is um, confluence of variant Kvari rivers uh, close to um, Freedom Square, uh, where uh, actually that's important because first of all, it's a very small patch of riparian forest. And secondly, uh, there's an attempt to revive this uh, connection between city and river by the artists uh, through annual art festival. Uh, next in interesting spot um, along Kvari in Tbilisi, I think, is Dry Bridge and uh, the Diana Park, since this is the most uh, socially and economically active uh, uh, area in the central part of the city near uh, Niam Tkvari. And uh, lastly, that's uh, Metehi area and uh, so-called cruise or the um, touristic boat, which is kind of a mobile site, uh, but that's also one of those rare cases where the recreational, uh, uh, recreational function of the uh, river is still used. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you so much, Mariam. It's a beautiful presentation. And certainly uh, very interesting to think of of the historical the true historical connections that we we once had with the natural elements um, and and how in the past I guess we we understood we had to understand natural processes for example those those water mills we had to understand the water to then generate electricity or to kind of generate something of use. Um, but the, that's kind of been very much lost in, in today's mod, modern age and things have been compartmentalized. And, um, but yeah, I mean, it's a fascinating, it's definitely a fascinating topic. Uh, and a lot of cities do struggle with that. Uh, and especially in even my city in Cape Town, um, they've buried about five, rivers that run through the main city and it's a constant question of how do we reimagine these rivers um, because they used to be a part of the city and and, uh, and people used to use the water from these rivers as kind of their means to live and their means to grow vegetables and farm and and everything was circulated around the rivers and the water but it's now kind of just been lost in a sense um, but yeah, it's fascinating to see the potential in there. Yeah. 
Thank you for the, your reflection, Darren. Yeah. Um, yeah, any, anyone else to add to that? Uh, okay. Yeah. Okay. Um, yeah. Okay. I I think I already gave Miriam my <laughs> feedback, so I want to ah. interfere here. <laughs> Miriam okay. is a doctorate student, so. Uh, at Ilya State University and I have met her several times. It's a very interesting topic for Tbilisi, I think, because river was, was the main uh, element in the city formation process. And all of a sudden, this element is disconnected from the city. <laughs> and, and I wish her good luck in further research. Thank you, yeah. All right. Yeah. Um, thank you so much. Fascinating from everyone today. Um, we really appreciate your uh, time and your acceptance in uh, coming onto this platform to present your work. Um, yeah, so I think Magda has one last um, overall comment of today's presentation, and then I think we'll yeah. wrap up from there. Yeah, thank you. Uh, I will do the conclusion part. Like, thank you for our guest speakers. Thank you for your contributions and supports, and all the participants who have been attending and who made this event more special. Uh, if you are an early career researcher and if you would like to give a talk, please get in touch. And also if you would like to join community or also if you have some comments or suggestions, please um, feel free to get in touch as well. And thank you for being the part of our growing and developing of our community. And please, if you have any uh, upcoming, uh, like uh, we are going to have upcoming seminars and please send us the abstracts during the Christmas time or even during the, uh, after the New Year's time. Thank you again to everyone. It was really wonderful uh, talk and seminar and good luck to your research. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you so much. Uh, have a good, good day, everyone. Cheers. <laughs> bye bye. Thank bye. you, everyone. Bye. bye. bye.